Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. I do appreciate that. Uh, quick announcements. Uh, Lent uh, is the season we are in, and Wednesday we will have services again, 10 o'clock in the morning, 6.30 in the evening. Uh, so please plan to join us for that. We will send the email tomorrow uh, with the link for registering uh, your attendance at that. So we appreciate your attendance. Uh, Ladies Aid will meet on, when, on, excuse me, on Thursday of this week, so all women are invited. The meeting starts at 10, uh, but then there's a fellowship time beforehand. It's in the fellowship hall, masks and distancing, everything like that all the way through. Uh, two weeks from today, I want to call your attention to something different and new that we're going to be trying. Uh, we're calling it Thinking of You, Praying for You. Um, March marks one year since we've been in COVID-19 and all the restrictions and everything else like that. Uh, and there are some members of our congregation in particular, certain members uh, who've been affected by it uh, quite a bit. And we just would like to gather for about an hour that Sunday afternoon, that's what it is, two weeks from today, two o'clock, just gather whoever would like to down in the fellowship hall uh, and we, we'll have a list of people and then we're gonna pray for them uh, but we're also going to write some cards and notes to them and things like that, uh, just to pray, just to let them know that we're caring for them and we're praying for them and so on. Uh, it's just an hour of time, uh, but it'd be kind of a neat thing to brighten up someone's day who may be, you know, in their homes for a long period of time and things like that. So uh, keep that in mind. It's going to be real simple. We'll have all the supplies. You don't have to prepare anything. We'll even have ideas of what to write on notes and things like that uh, for you. So uh, please plan to think about that. Kids are welcome to come too uh, because we're going to have some coloring sheets and stuff like that so when we send cards we can put something in that the kids did for them as well. Sunday school's done that a little bit too this year uh, as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll remind you again next week about all of it. Okay, that's it for announcements today. The order of worship will be on the screen starting with the hymn, O Savior, Precious Savior. Uh, you may remain seated for that opening hymn. And please stand for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear my voice when I call to you, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. 
You have been my helper. O oh Lord Almighty, gracious and compassionate, I, a poor sinner, plead guilty before you of all my sins. I have lived as if you did not matter and as if I mattered most. Your name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have faltered. I have not let your love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt, and those whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires have been soiled with sin. I repent of all these transgressions and ask for grace for the sake of my Savior Jesus. Grant me your Holy Spirit that I may amend my sinful life. God, be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak to you is from the Lord himself? Therefore, hear this good news. As a called and ordained servant of the Lord and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord remembers us and he will bless us. May the Lord make you increase, both you and your children. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. And you may be seated for the scripture readings. The Old Testament reading from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. This is the God, excuse me, this is the word of our Lord. And then the epistle reading for today is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died 
for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of our Lord. And then the Holy Gospel for today is from Mark chapter 8. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord. And we have a children's lesson for today. And for this children's lesson, I want to talk about names. Okay, in our reading from the Old Testament, you see that God is talking to Abraham or Abram and Sarai, and he changes their names. Okay, and so I want to, the first question I want to ask you is, what does your name mean? Okay, do you know that names have different meanings? Sometimes names mean different things. Well, I have this here. This is my name, and I don't remember where I got this from. I've had it for as long as I can remember. But this is my name, so Justin right here, and what it means. Okay, and it means upright or just one from the old French. Okay, so sometimes names have special meaning. I know that when Katrina and I we were having children and we started thinking about their names, we picked names that we liked the meaning for. Okay, so like, for example, Isaac, his name means laughter. And Kai, well, in Greek, his name means and. Okay, but the reason we chose it was Welsh. It means rejoice. And for Ezekiel, it means God is strong. And Oscar means spear of God, which I think is fairly appropriate because Oscar's a tank and he'll just go. Okay, but we, li we liked these meanings for names. And you see this in the Old Testament reading too because God has two people with their names. He chose Abram first and Sarai after. And the name Abram means exalted father. Okay, but it's a little strange because at this time, Abram, he doesn't have any children. Right? Abram means exalted father, but he has no children. And Sarai means my princess. So these are the names that their parents gave them, you know, and they seem really important. And God, you know, is working through the lives of these people, but he changes their name. And when he changes their names, he changes what their names mean to point to uh, the future that he has for them. Okay, so from Abram, he changes his name to what? Do you remember? Abraham, that's right. 
God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Do you know what Abraham means? The name Abraham means father of many. Okay, father of many. And it goes along with the promise that God had for Abraham. God told Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. Lots and lots of people and kings are going to come from you. And when he changed Sarah's name, or Sarai's name, he changed it from Sarai to Sarah. Do you know what Sarah means? Sarah means joy and laughter. Because when Sarah has her son, her first son Isaac, she laughs when she hears that it's going to happen. She is so excited to have a child. And these two names are the way that God changed, God showed them his promise for them. Excuse me. You know, in Abraham, he said, you're going to be the father of many nations. You don't have any children right now. But I'm going to change your name and start this plan in your life that you're going to be the father of many nations. And you think about, there's a song that you sing in Sunday school, right? It's called Father Abraham. Do you know that song? I know Miss Becky Becky has done it with you where you stand and you move your arms and do all that stuff. Yeah? Because that song helps us to understand this promise that God gave to Abraham. You're going to be the father of many nations. Okay, so for right now, I want you to do, shout out your name. Just your name. Great. Excellent. Okay. And that is a wonderful name that your parents gave you as a blessing. There's another name that you have. And that is a name that God gave you when you were baptized. Do you know what it is? Any, any guesses? Say that again. I can't hear you. Child of God? You are a genius. Because that is exactly what I was thinking. You see, you have your name, your regular name, you know, James or Gary or Al or, or Pastor Lyle. I'm sorry, Pastor Lyle. Lyle is... <laughs> but the name that you were given when you were baptized by God is child of God. Because God, when you were baptized, he chose you to be a part of his family. God did all of the things that we talk about in the Bible because he loves you and wanted you to be a part of his family. Okay. So today, as you go home, remember and tell your parents that you are a child of God, but also ask them if you don't know what your name means and why they picked it, because sometimes they have wonderful stories about that. Okay? All right. So let's close in prayer. I'm going to pray for us this morning. Fold your hands about your heads. Dear God, we thank you that you have given us a name, and that name is your child, child of God. We thank you so much, Lord, for loving us and keeping us always in your family. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen us and teach us more about you and your love for us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and will you all now please stand with me as we confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You can now please be seated for the next hymn.
and grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today for our sermon text, we're going to take up the reading from the Gospel of Mark. And in this Gospel reading, you see, it poses an important question. And really probably the most important question that people need to answer. And that question right away that Jesus is speaking is the question of, who is Jesus? You see, Jesus, he is talking with his disciples at this time, and he wants to know how people feel about the answer to this question. And he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? You know, he's not concerned with the disciples right now. He's going to ask them in a minute, but he starts with the other people. You see, the disciples, they have been following Jesus around and listening to him kind of in the midst of all of these crowds and gatherings of other people. And so while they're there, they've been listening. They've been listening to Jesus, but they've also been hearing what the other people are saying and kind of gauging what they think about Jesus. And so Jesus asks them first, he says, who do people say that I am? And what do other people think? Who are they saying that I am? And the disciples, they think about it and they, they reply, well, you know, some say that you're John the Baptist, or others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. And in all of these answers, it gives Jesus this picture that people don't really understand who he is. All of these answers are really deficient and insufficient answers as to who Jesus is. Because you mean John the Baptist, he served in this prepare, prepare, I can't even say the word, in this role of preparation for Jesus. He's preparing the people for the Christ to come. And Elijah, well, it's basically the same thing. Elijah was preparing for the Christ to come just for the Old Testament audiences long, long ago. And if you think about Jesus as a prophet, well, that goes further and further kind of down the scale of importance. Because while the people recognized prophets and knew who they were, they would rarely ever actually listen to the prophets or heed their warnings. It was just someone, one of those kind of crazy people who was always telling us not to do stuff. And what this reveals to Jesus is the people who are listening to him, you know, they're, they're following him, they're excited to see his miracles, but they don't really understand who he is. And so then Jesus turns to the disciples, his closest friends, those who've been following him, you know, for countless days and listening to him for hours on end, and he wants to know what they think. And so he poses the question to them, he says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And this word for you in the original Greek is an emphatic word. He wants to know who his closest friends and followers think he is. And I like the way that the NIV translates it because it does, shows the importance and emphasis on this by asking basically the same thing twice. What about you? Who do you, my disciples, my closest friends, those who have been around me for the longest, say that I am? And the disciples, specifically Peter, he, he's ready. He's got his answer immediately when Jesus asks the question. And Peter, with this answer, he's not just answering for himself. He is, in fact, kind of the spokesperson for the group of disciples and answering for all of them. He says, you are the Christ. You know, I have no doubt that Jesus was joyful when he heard this coming from his disciples and his closest friends because that's what he wanted them to know. That's what he wanted them to learn. After all of these kind of insufficient answers, these things that don't really understand who he is, the disciples get it right. The disciples understand who he is. They, they know, you know, all these other people, they, they've kind of been going around and, and they've listened to Jesus and heard the things, but they can't acknowledge him as the Christ, which is something even the demons that Jesus has driven out can do. But yet all the rest are having trouble. But thankfully, the disciples get it. They understand who Jesus is. Well, not exactly. You see, the disciples acknowledge who Jesus is, but they don't quite understand everything yet. Because right after they've 
acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, Jesus goes into explaining more about what that means. And he talks to them about what it means for him to be the Christ. He says, sorry, let me see. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So now that they've acknowledged it, Jesus says this is what it means. But the disciples aren't ready for that answer. You know, immediately after that happens, Peter comes up to Jesus and he confronts Jesus and rebukes him. He said, you can't say these things. And we're not going to talk about that a lot, that part specifically a lot today, because we're going to talk about that in one of the Lenten scriptures, or the Lenten services, excuse me, later in this season. But for now, it's just important to remember that the disciples weren't ready to receive this information. Because as Jesus is trying to explain this, he is trying to explain what it looks like for him to be the Christ. But now he moves into the next question. If who is the Christ is Jesus' first question, the second question is a typical Lutheran question. There we go. The pastor said it. Come on, guys. What does this mean? What does it mean that Jesus is the Christ? And Jesus starts, he goes into teaching them what that means that Jesus is the Christ for them, for the people who believe, for the people who follow him. See, this isn't just for the disciples that he's saying these words, but it's for all of the people who believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so he calls the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And you think about this question, what does it mean? And the words that Jesus says here, it led me to thinking about a poem that I've heard long ago, and you've probably heard it too, and it's the poem from Robert Frost. You know, the road not taken. And in that poem, Frost says, two roads diverge in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And taking the other, just as fair, though having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. But as to taking it about the same. And these two, the morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, doubted if I ever should come, be coming back. And I, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. See, in Jesus' words, he is laying two paths before his followers and disciples. There is the path of discipleship, the first path that Jesus talks about. And this path of discipleship has some requirements. The first one is the denial of self. And the second is to take up your cross and follow him. See, in this requirements that Jesus is listing first. This denial of self is not to say, as a commentator put it, to deny yourself of something, one thing. But the denial of self means to deny having yourself as the center of the universe. The denial of self means rearranging your priorities so that you are no longer the focus, the most important thing. But instead, God is the center. And you take up your cross and you follow him. And 
thinking about those words, well, it seems like this path has some hardships and challenges along with it. And that's very true. The path of discipleship isn't an easy path of discipleship that is always filled with flowers and roses and nice things. The path of discipleship is often one that looks like the path of Christ. One that has challenges when you try to tell people about the love of Christ. Or one that has struggles when people don't want to listen to you or don't want to hear what you have to say. This is the path that is not just for disciples, but for all followers and believers of Christ. But at the same time, though this path is filled with difficulties and struggles and challenges, it is also the only path that leads to life. Because you see, you have to be on this path in order to have life in Christ. It answers those two questions that you have. The first question is, who is Christ? And you acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior as the disciples did and follow him. It means that you are on the path of discipleship. But you see, in his explanations, Christ talks about this other path. This other path is for those people who don't acknowledge him or maybe who only say they believe but don't walk the path of discipleship. That path is one that has been well trodden. Many people have gone down that path. And when and you look at it first, it seems nice. It's a clear path. Go straight ahead. No obstacles or difficulties present before you. But where the path diverges greatly is in the end. Because that path eventually leads you into dark and tangled woods. And ultimately, at the end of that path is death and destruction. That is the path that those who don't believe walk down. And both of these questions and these paths lay before you. That first question you have to answer is, who is Christ? Your presence here today makes me think that you know the answer. Christ is the Savior, the one who has come, the one who was foretold, the one who was promised. And so knowing that, the answer or question now is, what does this mean? Because like I said, you have these two paths before you. The one that looks really nice and could lead you down a path of ease and comfort for a while. But then there's the other path. The one of discipleship, which includes challenges and fears and struggles. And my hope for you today is what Christ had. That knowing what you know you would follow the path of Robert Frost. That you would take the less traveled path. The path of discipleship. Because it makes all the difference. In Christ. Amen. We're going to continue our service this morning in prayer. And we just have one prayer request, and it's for me. <laughs> my surgery for my knee will be this coming Wednesday, so I appreciate all of your prayers for that procedure this coming week. Uh, would you all now pre please stand and pray with me? Great and wonderful God, you are our Lord Jesus Christ who has come into this world to save us through the perfect life that you led, the death that you died on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to, and the resurrection to new life that promises us that same future. We pray that you would remind us every day of your love for us and that you would go with us down the path of discipleship, that in the midst of all of its challenges and struggles, we would find joy in knowing you love us and all those whom we are seeking to teach your love to. We pray that you would encourage and strengthen us down that path, 
that we would continue to trust in you and look to you for all of our help and support and all things. Lord God, on that road, there are difficult and many challenges, and so we lift those challenges before you this morning as we pray for the family and friends and all of those who are affected by COVID-19. We mourn with those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray for strength and endurance and encouragement for those who are caring for those who are ill. We pray that you would bring healing to those who are ill, which you have done for so many already. And we pray that you would continue to do now and into the future. We ask that you would provide more vaccines for those in need. That you would also be with the health professionals and all those who make decisions, giving them your strength and wisdom and guidance. And Lord God, we ultimately pray that this disease would be destroyed. That it would be removed from our presence and we would be able to Again, enjoy all of the work that you are doing in this world. Lord God, I also pray for the surgeons and caregivers for me this coming week as they will be doing surgery on my knee. I ask that that recovery would go quickly and that I would be able to return to this wonderful work that you have given me soon. Lord God, we also pray for all those who are struggling with cancer and the difficult treatment and long duration that it often includes And so today we specifically lift up Lyndon Luke, Shonda Ursa, John Bassett, Kelly Stoyles, Liam Kiefer, Patty Himesness, Suzanne Lewis, and Mason Milham. Be with them always, Lord God, providing them strength and providing also for all of their needs of body, soul, and spirit. Lord God, we also lift up all of our members who are in care centers, especially Arlene Hankin and John Maloney, that you be with them as well, giving them hope in the future that you have for them as your great and wonderful children. Lord God, these requests and all others we lift up to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you all now please be seated for the next hymn. Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. In love you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation 
that come to us in his body and blood. Renew our zeal and faith in life and bring us at last to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated for the distribution.
And please stand for the dismissal. Now may this body which was given for you and this blood which was shed for you strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. And we pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, in loving kindness you sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be able to serve you constantly. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may remain standing for the last hymn. And you may be seated. We thank you again very much for joining us here today. Sunday School and Bible class will begin in about 20 minutes, so join us for that as well. Uh, you will be ushered out like we have been doing all along. Go in peace and serve the Lord.